good, good afternoon to all of you. What I'm going to talk today is a little bit different. I'm going to talk about the consumer, which will be the small farmer, the producer, and the supply of information to them. How this demand is being added by the supply of information and technology for them to have access to that information. So let's go 15 years ago. And 15 years ago, there were 480 million cellular phones. And there was around 6 billion people. Today, if we look at the situation today, we have 6.6 .6 billion cellular phones and 7 billion people. As you can see in the graph, the red line, which is the amount of cellular phones, is getting close to the population growth. Even, it could be that by today, this is 2013, the, the cellular phones are bigger than the people that we have in the world. What this means is like magic, no? Cellular phones penetration has increased enormously, and we hear all these nice stories about how good cellular phones are to alleviate poverty, how we can do microfinance, how we can do extension, how we can transmit prices to them. But is this situation so real? And that's why I want to look at the first element of this talk, which is about access. How is this that we are seeing at the global level, which in 1999, most of the expansion was in OECD countries, and today is across the globe, in developing countries and developed countries. How are we doing internally within these countries? And how much are we really reaching the rural poor? So for that, let me start first by looking to some examples of some countries. And here, what I'm bringing is two countries per continent. I randomly select them, basically. And the idea here is to show you that the rural penetration is not as good as we have expected. And this is a number that normally you won't see. Normally, the unit of telecommunications will tell you the global number at the country level. But if you look, for example, the case of Bolivia in Latin America, there are 18.7 phones per 100 inhabitants, while the urban penetration is 77. If we go to Malawi, 32.3 in rural areas. And even if we go to Bangladesh, the country of Karamin Bank, of Junus, who won the Nobel Prize by trying to link women farmers to microfinance using cellular phones, there we have 56 phones per 100 inhabitants in rural areas. So clearly still we have an access gap and we don't have this, this convergence that we see at the global level in terms of the number of phones. But the situation is a little bit even more complicated. Why? Because it's not only to have the access to the phone, like many of you have here, it's also how much I pay to be able to have the minutes I need to connect and to communicate and to get that information. And if we start looking at the prices, the story changes significantly. And let me bring you the example of Brazil. And why I'm going to bring Brazil? The reason I'm bringing Brazil, because Brazil is a big country, it has been growing substantially, but not only that has been the country where inequality has reduced significantly in the last 10 years, significantly. And also nutrition and hunger has been reduced significantly because of all the different programs that were implemented in the last 10 years in Brazil. Now, if we take the basic basket of phones, prepaid phones that I need to consume to be able to have this minimum communication, remember I'm talking of prepaid phones, the basket in Brazil of this minimum level consumption costs around 80 reales. Now, an average household consumes around 5% of their income in telecommunications. And if we look across the income distribution of a Brazilian consumer, from the poorer households, which will be the rural, the smallholders we're talking about, the middle income and the richer, the poor household will only be able to pay 2.3 reales a month using 5% of his income. The middle income, 26.1 reales, and the richer, 140. You see now the gap. Not only is a gap in the equipment, but once you have the equipment, the price you have to pay is enormous for what I can pay with my income. Now, can we solve this? And the answer, I think, is yes. This can be substantially improved. And I see two ways in which we can resolve that. One way is, of course, regulating. Why? Because today, prepaid phones, a minute of prepaid phones, cost several times what I am paying and what you are paying here in Rome in a post plan. So essentially, what happens today is that the rural are subsidizing the urban. And that's why we could have these very fancy equipment in our hands. And it should be the opposite. It should be the urban cross-subsidizing the poor. So regulation has to improve significantly to be able to improve the rate these poor farmers are paying. That's one solution. But the other way is to go a little bit out of the box and start thinking on technology. If I ask you if you want to do an international call, what you will use, assuming that you don't have access to the IFAR phone? You will use Skype or you will use WhatsApp. Why? Because the marginal cost of an international call is extremely low. And the technical reason of that is because data doesn't compete with voice. So basically the cost, once I have fiber optics and broadband, of a voice call is zero. 
Now, why rural poor don't have that situation? If you look at the penetration of broadband in rural areas, it's exactly the same as in 1999, close to zero. Why? When we can provide to them IP telephony, they can do these calls with the equipment we have today, and they could get very low rates. So the point I want to make is that for access, we still need a lot to do, and there are ways to do it with existing technology, and we need to figure out how to improve that. Now, saying that, and assume that we're in a world that will resolve this problem of access, people heard this talk, they deploy fiber optics across the world, everybody has a phone today. Is that enough? And that brings me to my second concept, the concept of content. So I already have the equipment. I am getting what I want in that equipment. And that's where I want to bring the link between supply and demand. So we did a review of all the work that was done in this topic. How much it impacted farmers to have price information systems. How much it impacted them to have extension systems through cellular phones or ICTs. How much it impacted them to have any different type of information, even there is information for nutrition, for health issues. And sadly, the result of this enormous review was that in many few cases, very few cases, the effect of these systems of information were not welfare improving for these farmers. And in the only cases where it was welfare improving was because the supply and the information that was provided was customized to their needs, to their demand. And that's when it really worked. For example, if I am a West Bengali farmer in India and I am producing potatoes, I don't care about the market in New Delhi, I don't care about the market in Mumbai, which would, normally these systems will provide to me the wholesale information of the prices in those two capitals. What I care is about the markets, the local markets around me and where I can sell my produce, locally. And if I don't customize the information to that, they won't use the system. And that's why today, in many countries, we see very fancy systems where I can enter four-digit codes, but the price that I am getting is not the price I, I care. Therefore, I don't use them, and they stop using them. So content is a huge barrier, and we need to significantly improve content to be able to move forward. And that's what I want to raise, and I think it's something important to, to think about, how we can improve and make this demand and this supply to respond to that demand. For sure, I can create supply. Gay, uh, Apple has been extremely successful at doing that. We have created very fancy equipment and the demand has responded. But remember, these rural households only spend 5% of their income. They have a huge budget constraint. So if I'm going to use one rupee or one dollar in phones, it's money that I'm not giving to my kids for food. So I will be very careful what I do. And that's why they stop using these systems. And this moves me, moves me to the third word that I want to use today, which is capability. Remember, we are trying to provide information to farmers in rural areas, which are aging, as we know. Most of them are not well educated. The majority don't know how to read and write. And they have very low concepts of mathematics. But they know how to cope the risks. But I am giving them information on prices, maximum price, minimum price, average price. Even in some cases, I have seen systems in which they provide them the variance so that they can predict the price in the future. Volatility of temperatures. How we expect a person that doesn't know how to read and write and doesn't have the basic knowledge of mathematics to understand these concepts? I need to figure out a way to break this capability barrier. I'm not only giving them a sophisticated technology, but I'm also trying to change the way they understand things. And this came to me and crashed to me in reality when I was doing an experiment in West Bengal, we basically decided to go to very poor rural villages and try to provide them phones randomly to be able to test through a traditional randomized control trial to be able to test the effect of good content. So we resolve the access because we provide them the phones, we resolve the content, we provide exactly the content they needed, and we distribute hundreds of phones in this area which before didn't have access to cellular phones. And the result of that was that in the first week we found that many of these phones were not being used. And despite we were sending the good content and they have the phone and we trained the people basic ways to use the phone, they were not being used, so we went to the households. And what we found, sadly, was that many of these households were using these phones as ornaments. For them, were ornaments. They were not charging them, they were not using them. And that's a big problem. That's the capability. And that's what brings me to Milagros, miracles in English. Milagros is a little student of secondary school in the northern part of Peru in a place called Yacanora in the mountains, Cajamarca is the region. Milagros every morning has to walk three hours to go to school. And every morning, any afternoon, she has to walk back three hours. Can you imagine? She doesn't have breakfast normally, and she has, if she has, a very light meal. So basically, she lives in one meal a day. Now, clearly, 
she has a problem with nutrition, and the quickest thing to observe is anemia. So Milagros falls asleep in her class. Her performance is not good because she doesn't have the micronutrients that she needs to be able to progress. But what is the link between Milagros and my cellular phones and my farmers? The link is that I think Milagros could be the bridge to create this link. Why? Because Milagros goes every morning to school, three hours. She knows mathematics. She's in secondary school. She knows how to read and write. She can help to link and to bridge and break this barrier of knowledge of the farmer. She can also adapt the content and adjust the content for what the farmer needs. And not only that, by being in the school, it becomes very cost effective to transfer information to them because I have a lot of kids sitting in the classes. So Milagros could be a way to create that bridge. And that's something that we need to think about. And what we did in IFPRI, we started a program called, called Happy Faces. And the idea of the program was exactly that. We test in the schools in Yakanora by providing them a lab connected to internet, very cheap, $10,000. That's what it cost. And with that, we provide information to them. We started with a very simple message to see if the kids pick up the information. And the message was about taking a, a, a pill of iron in a health center. We use three types of messages. The health center provider, the official of the location, and a soccer player. Why a soccer player? Because the kids told us that they admire a soccer player. And, sad, and strangely enough, both kids and girls admire the soccer player. So we provide them every time they log in into their computer information on how and where they should pick these pills and why these pills were good for them, iron pills. And the result was that the message spilled over. The first day you had 10 kids, the second day 30, and it grew enormously. Not only that, they start bringing kids from their households, their brothers. So what this showed to us is that the message completely was picked up by the kids. And that was our first goal. The second goal to create this bridge was, OK, now that we know that kids not only learn the message, apply it, and this was, they went to pick the pills for 60 days, which is what they needed, we also wanted to know if they could change the behavior of the parents. So what we did is we went to all the farms of these kids and we identified very simple problems they were facing in their farms. And these problems were as simple as earworm in their maze. Very simple problems in taking care of their animals. And then we choked them with information on how to resolve the, the problems. And what we found is that they were able to resolve those problems. So the kids helped to create the bridge to communicate to the parents and change the behavior. And in some occasions, the kids by themselves create the molasses trap that we were teaching them through the videos to resolve the problem. So clearly, Milagros helped to create that bridge. So I want to end today by saying, we have an option, and we have an opportunity to empower information. And we need to break this barrier of accessibility, content, and capability. So that Milagros and Tefu, for example, can show their parents and can help to break this barrier to be able to allow and communicate so that we could be able to say and talk about the power of information. Thank you.